spoken at the senseless killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. The uh, protests that we've uh, that have followed around the world and right here in McMinnville speaks volumes about the systemic racism that shows up in our public institutions. As a city council, we support the Black Lives Matter movement and are taking the following steps to identify and dismantle the institutional racism within our own organization. We've got three things that we are doing. We're training employees about uh, implicit bias, uh, systemic racism, equality, and inclusion, ensuring safe and respectful, respectful environments on our advisory boards and commissions, partnering with experts in diversity, equality, inclusion, so that we can evaluate our policies and practices through a racial, a racial equality lens. We recognize that we have much to learn as an organization and as individuals. We are committed to that learning and making McMinnville a city that is safe, welcoming, equitable for all of our residents. Thank you for allowing me to read that. Uh, one thing that we've not done on Zoom is have the Pledge of Allegiance, and I think it might be appropriate that we do that this evening. So I will lead uh, you in the Pledge of Allegiance, and if you would just follow me. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance. to the flag. The United, United States, States, States of America, America. and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, which stands one nation, one nation under, God, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. A lot of people, <laughs> uh, we made it through. So uh, thank you uh, for bearing that that was a good thing to do this evening. Uh, we have a proclamation this evening, and so uh, the proclamation is um, L. GBTQ Pride Month, and so uh, Kylie, I'm going to turn it over for you to introduce that, and then we'll we'll do the proclamation. Kylie, hi, thank you. Um, so it's imperative, um, even more so today, given the civil unrest, the nationwide protests happening against racism and police brutality toward people of color, uh, that our city leaders ensure all members of our community are valued and welcomed. LGBTQIA individuals are more likely to experience discrimination, harassment, and other disadvantages in all aspects of their lives, from housing to healthcare and everything in between. Those disadvantages are multiplied when their identity intersects with other identities, such as their mental or physical ability or health, their gender, their age, the color of their skin, or the country in which they were born. Publicly proclaiming June as Pride Month, along with numerous cities across our country, demonstrates McMinnville's commitment to our core values of accountability, stewardship, courage, and equity. I want to thank Pam Davis, who is the Assistant City Manager in Boulder, Colorado, for assisting with the language in this proclamation. Um, she served as an extra set of eyes for me as we were drafting that. Pam's also the leader of Civic Pride, which is the first nationally recognized LGBTQIA plus professional association uh, for local government management. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, I will read the proclamation designating June as Pride Month. Whereas the fight for equality continues for lesbians, gays, bisexuals, uh, transgender and queer and quizzing in questioning the LGBTIQIA+, and other historically uh, marginalized members of our community, and the responsibility falls on each of us to form a more equitable and inclusive society. And whereas the city of McMinnville pledges to honor, exhibit, and otherwise live out our core values of stewardship, uh, accountability, courage, and equality, and whereas June 28, 2020 marks the 51st anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising, six days of demonstration led by Marsha P. Johnson, a black transgender woman, uh, sparked by the targeting and arrest by uh, police, of, uh, police of lesbian, gay, and transgender bar participants in violation of their civil rights, an event widely recognized at the beginning of the modern uh, the modern gay right movement, 
And whereas June 2nd, 2000, President Bill Clinton declared June to be Gay and Lesbian Pride Month to commemorate the June 28th, uh, 1969 Stonewall Uprising. And on June 1st, 2009, President Barack Obama uh, expanded this uh, commemoration by declaring June to be the Gay Pride, Bisexual and Transgender Transgender, uh, Transgender uh, Pride Month, and whereas the city of McMinnville stands with the LGBTI uh, or TQIA plus community in the struggle to ensure equal treatment for all to defend and advocate for LGBTQIA plus rights of human rights, and whereas Despite the extraordinary and inspiring progress, LGBTQIA plus Americans continue to face discrimination simply for being who they are. And whereas the city of McMinnville commits to advocate for protections for all LGBTQIA plus individuals to make our city a place where all people, regardless of their sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression are treated with dignity and respect. Now, therefore, I, Scott A. Hill, mayor of McMinnville, do hereby proclaim the month of June as Pride Month. In witness thereof, I have heretofore set my hand this ninth day of June, 2020, signed Scott A. Hill, mayor of McMinnville. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to that part in our program this evening where we will have comments from citizens. And this is where individuals uh, may speak on any topic other than a matter that is in litigation, a quasi-judicial land use matter, a matter scheduled for public hearing at some future date. Um, Announce your comments. Your, your, your comments will be limited to three minutes per person, and we're going to take a total of 30 minutes this evening. Uh, if you wish to speak, raise your hand feature in Zoom to request to speak. Once your turn is, is up, uh, announce your name, unmute the mic, and, uh, and you will be uh, acknowledged by our city recorder, Claudia who will announce you. Now we may have a number of individuals at the McMinnville City Hall, and then you can come up and uh, to the mic, identify yourself. So again, anyone that would like to speak uh, to the council this evening? And I'll turn it over to you, Claudia. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the City Council. My name is Bill Whiteman, a resident of McMinnville. My purpose for being here tonight is to encourage the leadership of this city to maintain a strong and well-trained law enforcement department. I feel that way not only about the city of McMinnville, but also about Yamhill County and the state of Oregon. Now, what happened in Minneapolis with that uh, police department and that incident was truly unforgivable and absolutely a terrible, terrible thing. But that action does not represent law enforcement officials throughout the United States. And I believe that if they are well trained and uh, given consideration that uh, those kinds of incidents not only will uh, be lowered, but also we will have the benefit of having extremely well-trained uh, individuals involved in our law enforcement community. Now, I believe that <clears throat> part of that uh, training has to be in public relations and uh, also in citizen relations. Whenever they stop an automobile for some violation or purpose, whenever they come in contact with an individual, my, my belief is that they are uh, representing the city of McMinnville in a guest relation or a customer servant standing. I spent 50 of my 81 years in the food service business, and I don't believe that the action that took place in Minneapolis represents all law enforcement any more than I believe that a manager that I hired who took me for $50,000 one summer represents all the restaurant managers in the state of Oregon, the city of McMinnville, or the U.S. 
so please, as you look towards the budget, please maintain a strong law enforcement community because it is a help and our citizenship deserves to have that help. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Claudia, next. Please state your name. My name is Julius and I live in McMinnville. Um, I guess I had more of a question for you guys to maybe think about. Um, you know, we're talking about police, but I'm wondering in the schools, before these people get to police, is there anything we can be doing in the classroom to teach about stereotypes and unfair biases so that we can avoid racism as a community and as a government. Uh, maybe even counselors, counselors in schools that are not white that can maybe have a different perspective and communicate differently with the different students. Um, I think those kinds of things are more important than letting the problems carry out into adulthood and then uh, expressed through different uh, authoritarian figures. So uh, maybe think about hitting the schools before, before other things. That's all. Thank you for your comments. Claudia next. Yes, we have Brittany Reese, who's on Zoom. We'll unmute her mic. OK. Can you hear me? We can, Brittany. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna get out of my kid zone real quick. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is, uh, just wanted to thank uh, the city, specifically Parks and Rec, for opening up the Parks and Rec program. And uh, also uh, suggest, as a way to recoup losses, I would love to see if there's any way we can work as a community to open up the Parks and Rec sports programs over the summer. Uh, I know there's a lot involved in that decision, but I would, I know myself and many other families uh, speak about it daily about how it has impacted their children. So if we can support the city by opening up those sports programs, I want to suggest that be looked at, but actually tonight I'm just thanking the city for moving swiftly to open up those playgrounds once the guidelines are updated. And that's really my call. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. And then Susan, if you'll take note and maybe reach out to her, and I know you've had some dialogue uh, that you put on your website uh, or on your Facebook page, but maybe that might be appropriate. Uh, Claudia, next. Yes, we have Christopher Anderson on Zoom. We'll unmute his mic. Okay. Hello, my name is uh, Christopher Anderson. Um, I'm a uh, in McMinnville. Um, I would, according to the budget, I'd like to, for you guys to consider um, that we look to actually keep the budget of the police and police department in line with about 10% of other um, services and therefore allow police services to gather assistance from those services like social workers. Um, I also ask that you guys consider um, resourcing other organizations for um, police not policing themselves because currently we use a for-profit police organization um, lexicon in order to evaluate their um, current, um, how they are effective and non-effective in maintaining laws and law and order. I also request that our budget for our police department not include um, military gear or um, ghost cars, because a hidden police force is not a police force working for us. I also, um, I also request that our budgeting not include uh, anything for lawsuits or bad police officers, and also that um, we do a budget freeze on the police department if um, they do not remove um, bad cops and do not police themselves. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Christopher. Claudia, next. We have Chris Chenoweth on Zoom that will unmute his mic. 
Good evening, Mayor and Councilors. It's good to see you, um, although I can't be seen. <laughs> um, I want to start by saying first, I don't want anything to be misconstrued by what I'm about to say. Um, I find the actions of the police officer in uh, these events that have taken place to be reprehensible. Um, and in no way do I want to have uh, my words somehow come off as if I'm condoning any behavior on his part. That's my disclaimer. Um, I uh, read a post today that got me kind of emotional, got my attention, and um, I'm gonna read a part of that post and then I'm gonna make a about 10 second comment. Um, so, um, I can get to the right wording here where this is. Um, so please, this is from a police officer. I don't know in what uh, police department. I don't know in what city it's anonymous. I don't know if it's male. I don't know if they're female. I don't know their gender. I've already said that. I don't know their race, but this is toward the end of their comments. So please, please take some of these jobs away from us. Please find someone else to respond to the homeless man on the corner. Please find someone else to respond to the suicidal ex-soldier. Please find someone else to make the death notification to the parents of the teenager who just killed herself in a car crash on her way home from prom. Please find someone else to go check on the child who usually plays outside at this time of day, but you haven't seen since his dad got home slamming doors angry. Please find someone else to help his battered wife escape her relationship. Please find someone else to keep that troubled preteen from slipping fully into a life of crime before he can even drive. I'm begging you, please. But until you do, until you do, we'll keep coming. Every time you call, every time you need us. And we'll keep doing our best with what tools you have given us in the system you've built for us. We'll keep showing up because no one else is going to or is required to. I just wanted to take the time to say to our police department and if Matt Scales is in the room to, to the chief of police specifically, um, in the midst of everything that's going on, there's a lot of us that are very grateful that we have a police department and for the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Claudia next. Okay, thank you for those that have made comment this evening. That takes us to our next area on the agenda, which is advice and informational items. And so we'll have reports from counselors on committee and board assignments. And I'm just going to look at my screen and go across. So Sal, I have you first, if you'd like to report out. Thanks, Mayor, I was having trouble with the uh, mute button there. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the report, the, um, uh, the Council of Governments um, met last week. We uh, approved the uh, COG budget. Uh, the, um, the, the COG has actually had a really interesting uh, shift during COVID-19. For years, the uh, agency has provided uh, banking services, uh, small business loans, um, and it's been sort of kicking along for many years without, and it really kind of been a, a drain on the uh, Council of Government's budget. And this year, because of what happened with COVID-19, they uh, have actually been able to transact uh, several million dollars worth of uh, small business loans that have kept uh, several small businesses uh, able to operate with capital uh, during this uh, period of COVID-19. Um, so really happy that that has um, been the case with the COG. Um, I also would like to just briefly uh, take a moment to uh, acknowledge the people who came out today to protest uh, and, and have come out several days to protest uh, the, uh, the killing of um, Mr. Floyd. The, the, um, 
I, I've been very impressed by the chief of police, Matt Scales, in terms of how he has engaged with people, listened to the concerns that, that people have had, and have, has really taken an, an effort to, um, to, to engage in pro-social dialogue with people who have a lot of legitimate and pent up concerns about policing in this country. And I really appreciate that. I also wanted to note for people who may be listening that um, I was asked to find out uh, what the McMinnville uh, Police Department policies are on uh, eight immediate actions that are being recommended uh, for reform. And I was really pleased to see when Chief Scales sent me his uh, note about that, that you know, most, if not all of those eight reforms are already uh, practices uh, in the McMinnville Police Department. And uh, I think that is a testament to uh, Chief Scales' leadership. Um, and I, I would uh, just wanna make one comment about, we've had, I've taken probably 50 or 60 emails, I think probably everybody on the council has, uh, asking to defund the police. Um, I believe that police reform is needed, uh, but I think that that is not going to be an inexpensive or easy process. Uh, the kinds of wraparound services that are needed to deal with homelessness and mental health issues in this community, the upfront um, uh, evaluation is gonna require different kinds of staffing than we currently have. And I think it's gonna be a long, you know, a, a, not a, not a short-term process, but a long-term process um, to make the changes that we need to move that in, in a direction of, of even more community policing than, than we're already doing today. So uh, with that, I'll just leave it, but I, I, I uh, do appreciate Chief Scales and, and his leadership, particularly at this time. Thank you, Sal. Uh, let's move over to Wendy. I have you up on my screen next. You're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. So we did have a Miroc meeting. Yay. Um, so we, we had some great discussion. We, a lot of what we were talking about was around um, supporting how the um, Miroc could do special programs to support post COVID recovery for businesses. The first one was the MDA came to us to talk to us about uh, a COVID recovery funds grant that they'd like to go out for to help the uh, Third Street businesses um, with getting PPE and sanitizing supplies to make their um, customers feel safe when they come to their, their establishments. And um, there's a match that the MURAC can uh, participate in uh, to help make that happen. We did have some questions that really were around uh, if they, the, um, the benefit could extend to all businesses within the urban renewal area. Uh, but in the end, Muroc was generally in favor of supporting the grant and, uh, and we'll probably see something come back more further in future meetings on that. Uh, the MEDP also wanted us to look at extend, extending the urban renewal boundary, district boundary. There's one particular uh, parcel that a uh, uh, private investor uh, developer is looking at developing, and it looked like it would be a win-win for us to be able to support that development with some dollars and also for it to benefit the, the, um, the tax base in the urban renewal. and. So there was some discussion around that. The MURAC members after the discussion around that parcel felt like it was a beneficial to all parties to look at extending that, uh, the boundary to that parcel. Um, and then the last thing we talked about was COVID recovery facade improvement grant. We did a similar facade improvement grant that was uh, for a certain period of time for the, uh, the Northeast Gateway area to encourage development. Um, the proposal was to have a grant that had significantly less investment required from the property owners and a larger proportion from the city so that it would encourage people who were getting ready to open up again or just opening up again to refresh their facades at this time. And so it would be time um, uh, only for a certain period of time, limited time. and. 
the MURAC committee was also in favor of doing that. They thought there would be some real benefit to seeing lots of freshening of facades going on and that it was a way that we could help businesses downtown with the MURAC money. And so those were the primary things for MURAC. Um, does that mean I'm, my time's up? Nope. <laughs> You're shut off. Uh, so the, the other thing I'd just like to acknowledge, um, I will, I thought I would talk a little bit more about the responses to some of those emails in our budget meeting. So I won't go into that in detail now, but I'll share my thoughts on that when we get into the budget section. But I would like to acknowledge our citizens and our police force with regards to our uh, the response to the heinous um, killing of Mr. Floyd. Um, we across the country, we see a lot of, um, pre of uh, vigils and uh, demonstrations that wound up being violent and not very respectful of each other. And I, I think it just is a testament to our citizens, our community and to the police department that there's open dialogue around an issue that's a really difficult issue and that uh, together we're gonna be able to find solutions in the way that this, um, the way that the uh, perspectives are being presented and able to, for us to continue to have dialogue and that's when, where we're gonna find the most effective solution. So I just really appreciate our, our town and our, and our police department even more after observing um, how, how we've worked together on processing this. So just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, let's move over to Kelly. I've got you next on my screen. I don't have a lot of, to report tonight. I do want to state that Black Lives Do Matter. And I want to thank Matt for sending out the letter. I spent a fair amount of time this afternoon just uh, emailing everybody who emailed me with his response. So I uh, hope you get it and read it and know that we really are working on this. But I, I feel like some of the issues are, you know, we've already kind of responded to them. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, let's uh, move over to Remy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, great news to report um, in that uh, the emergency board did end up releasing um, $200 million into the state of Oregon for all states, counties, cities. Um, of that, uh, 50 million was immediately called upon that could be used. And of that, $1.3 million is headed to YCAP um, in emergency rental assistance. Uh, along with YCAP receiving this $1.3 million from the emergency board, um, we did uh, ask the emergency board in, the, in considering the release of these dollars to change the initial initially proposed criteria, which um, part of that criteria to qualify for this rental assistance would be that your um, household would be earning 50% of the area media income. And we did ask the emergency board to increase that to 80% of the area media income, thereby making many, many more of our citizens, especially those who are currently out of work, eligible for these rental assistance dollars. Um, the emergency board chose to make that increase. And so um, YCAP is not yet um, able to start issuing those checks, but our citizens need to know if they are in need of rental assistance. We have the most dollars we have ever had uh, to support um, our McMinnville families, our Yamhill County families with rental assistance dollars to allow them to focus on stabilizing their households in other ways through focusing on work, uh, mental health, uh, et cetera. Um, so that is <clears throat> a huge feather in YCAP's uh, 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 hat, so to speak, um, uh, not to understate it, it's, it's not a feather, it's a, um, it's a tremendous amount of financial support for our area that should bring a tremendous amount of housing stability. And I'm very grateful to everybody at YCAP that did the hard work to help uh, secure those dollars for our area. Um, 
that is my my biggest update update really we we did have a, a mcminnville affordable housing task force meeting as well um we're continuing um with a lot of work we've been doing um i guess i should say that you know i think we're all aware that the governor has not yet called a special session and it's somewhat of a question mark um, however, if that special session does get called, it is likely that House Bill 4001 will be brought back because the monies in that bill are also relevant to um, COVID-related expenses, um, uh, and, and that would be the reason to call the uh, special session. Um, there is a, a fair amount of um, uh, resistance to calling that special session, um, as special sessions, uh, uh, I believe this is right, uh, don't have the same time frames around them as um, the regular session and the short session. So there is some concern of entering a session uh, without a lot of parameters of what would be its stop time or date. Um, and if it was called, it would be specifically to address COVID-related issues. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of communities out there are talking about uh, just a, a youth sports and how and when youth sports are going to come back. Um, and I've been pleased to be getting uh, regular updates from our Parks and Rec director. And so um, I look forward to hearing more from our department heads that, that have been um, uh, who've, who've had new things coming onto their own plates. Um, a lot of communities are dealing with the same the um, same issues. Um, uh, and then, I, Mr. Mayor, to affirm what you've already said and, and to add my, my voice to the choir uh, is, is that yes, that the, the city of McMinnville is attuned to systemic racism um, and I and we do support the Black Lives Matter movement um, and I'm glad that we've already started steps such as DEI training um, for city leadership, the regular rotation of DEI training that happens within our police force, um, and, uh, um, and and that I I know that as a city we will continue to to self-evaluate and um, and that I and that we are committed to identifying and dismantling institutional racism within our own organizations. Um, I also, uh, like Councillor Peralta, um, had received correspondence um, on eight count weight and then forward that to our chief of police and was grateful to get a very um, a thorough response on those policies and, and um, would, uh, hope that um, uh, he'll be able to share those with us this evening, or I know that he will, so if there's time in his report. So um, thank you for preparing that and allowing us to respond to our citizens broadly. Um, and to our citizens who didn't receive emails uh, back from me today, my count is at around 100 emails today um, that just from citizens on um, on this one issue, not related to any of the other council work um, or other correspondence. So do know that I have read your emails I um, and I am responding to you uh, in this format at this time. Um, and I have more thoughts as we move forward, but that's my council report. Thank you. Thank you, Remy. Uh, let's move over to Zach. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the time. Um, on pure council committee updates, uh, landscape review committee, no, nothing major to report. Um, I'm not uh, liaising on the historic landmark committee anymore. Um, McMinnville Community Media, we had a big update last time and um, no, uh, nothing up to update there other than they're working hard um, COVID to make sure everything that we're doing is getting out there um, and doing a good job to continue and, and push out streaming content. Um, local, that concerns local citizens. Um, the MAC PAC, we had a great meeting um, and uh, talked a lot about uh, the MAC PAC. So just in case nobody knows, that's the um, discussion forming around parks and recreation and, and, and uh, 
larger package of, of kind of our facilities, what programs we're going to be offering and, and how we go about the discussion about do we build a new community aquatic center? What does that look like? Where would it be? Does it just a community center? That, that bigger discussion. Um, we entered a programming phase discussion um, a few days ago, last, last week, Thursday. Uh, it was programming heavy, which was really fun to talk about. Um, and we also continued to improve um, uh, the discussion and the creation of the lens in the, of that which we're going to make all these decisions through um, discussions around are we creating safe places are we thinking about everything are we considering everyone um, in our decisions and in our selections for programming for facilities for locations of facilities um, so it's it's been a really robust discussion that um, uh, have a lot of uh, potent parallels to what's going on now um, so it's been interesting to have um, the, everyone on that committee is really excited and and um, it's a good good reminder of doing good things um, and that's kind of my uh, council and committee updates I would echo everything uh, that we've all been, been saying mr. mayor appreciate your statement you prepared and read um, that was a delight and um, every all my previous counselors updates including Councilor Drabkin before me's um, phrasings were really good and I, I would echo, echo all that and our council and city support for the Black Lives Matter movement. And I'm uh, looking forward to hopefully, I guess during our budget hearing a, a more robust discussion on the responses to the myriad of, of emails we've been getting and, and I've been reading and engaging in, in some good discussions. And so I'd like to commend our, our city and our citizenry for uh, a good, healthy discussion um, that's been been engaging and, and uh, challenging and, and, and pushing. And we've, we've certainly heard you. And I'd also like to tip my hat to the to the chief. I've watched watched his remarks um, on video from the vigil at Civic Hall and um, found his his words really moving. And, and after discussing with him today, I think his phrasing was he's ready to lean into whatever needs to happen. So um, I, I really appreciate his stance, and we're ready to we're ready to be at the table. So. That's my update and forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Let's move over to Adam. Yeah, first, just to acknowledge the Black Lives Matter movement, all comments that the counselor made, your comments start off nightmare. Um, if you're on the road, it's Adam, we're having a, a tough time hearing you. And I see that he's fallen off. So we'll, we'll come back to Adam if he comes back on. Um, let me just do a brief update. Um, um, I, I want to share uh, this the last two weeks I've been involved in a number of LOC meetings as we have been discussing uh, the upcoming uh, annual conference that's going to be held in October and this will be the first uh, virtual conference that uh, LOC has uh, has uh, uh, or is going to und und undertake and the conference uh, the breakout sessions are going to be on October 15th October 16th with board meetings and other meetings on Tuesday and Wednesday. They're half day sessions. And so those that have had a hard time not being able to go to the conference just because of not being able to get off of work, this may be much more attainable. We've set the uh, conference program and we solidified that today. The cost will be $29 uh, to attend the virtual conferences. Uh, we've also over the last uh, well two months we've been working on various committees at the LOC on setting the uh, uh, legislative agenda for this upcoming year. I'm sitting on the energy, environmental, and transportation committees, and uh, we've finished this week all of those discussions and the other six committees are uh, finishing theirs up and then we'll be sending that out to cities to rank uh, the things that they feel are important for us to advocate at LOC for uh, to the legislature when they are in session. Uh, I'd also um, have had an opportunity 
to meet individually or with uh, Jeff uh, with the hospital so that we know the capacity there and great capacity. They have PPE. Um, uh, so our hospital in this epidemic is, is well uh, positioned to take care of any of our needs there. Had an opportunity this week to meet with the chamber and uh, solidifying our relationship and the things that they're working on. Uh, today I had an opportunity to meet with MEDP and talking about um, economic development and what Scott uh, uh, Cooper is doing. He shared with me that it is just amazing that there's more economic development uh, activity going on right now than the whole time he's been here in McMinnville. There's active uh, active companies looking at uh, uh, industrial space out in the industrial area. And as uh, Wendy had mentioned, came to MEDP and asking us to expand our urban uh, renewal area to include the former uh, mission building uh, on Lafayette. And because uh, uh, the grow uh, the grow entity that was there, uh, marijuana grow entity, they've left and now that building is for sale and there's some interest in that and we'd like that to be in the uh, urban renewal area because of the growth that's going to be happening there. Uh, lastly, I just shared two things. Um, every Friday, LLC is doing the COVID conference call at 10.05, and for those that have uh, joined that, that is an hour that's just packed with information. Last week, we had a report from Peter DeFazio's uh, office, uh, Edward Gowan, who is the Northwest Regional Director uh, of uh, for Peter DeFazio's Committee on Infrastructure. We talked about infrastructure dollars that are coming. Uh, for transportation, rail, and other activities. And so uh, if that goes through uh, the legislative process back in D.C., we're going to see uh, over a period of time significant dollars coming in for infrastructure, and that will bring people back to work. And then lastly, on Tuesdays and Fridays at 1 o'clock, the Yamhill County kind of coalition and reporting out uh, from entities uh, within the county continues to happen. Um, so again, let's see. Uh, I don't see Adam rejoining us. I'll just ask, Adam, are you on the line? Okay, I don't hear him, and so let's uh, let's move over to reporting of department heads. And again, I'll try to make sure that I pick everyone up. Susan, enjoyed uh, your presentation. Any other things that you'd like to share with with council? Uh, I would just let you know that we are working very hard to get things reopened. It takes a lot of work in terms of procuring the right equipment. Sometimes we get 48 hours notice of the guidelines that are in place before they actually say you can open. And so I appreciate everybody's patience while we work through bringing staff back on, um, figuring out what the new guidelines are. We're going to have some tough conversations about cost recovery, um, given the new guidelines that are coming down in terms of how many people can be in a facility and how with the staff to child ratio is, for example. So we're gonna be slogging through that over the next few weeks. We do not have a date yet on the pool. That is probably one of the most asked questions I get. But the good news is you've already heard this tonight, the playgrounds are open again, and we're very, very happy about that. So keep watching our social media for info on that. Thank you, Susan, and congratulations on uh, being able to move so quickly, because I do know that information comes out from the governor's office very quickly, and uh, it doesn't give us much time to prepare. Uh, let's move over to Kylie. Report. Hi there. Um, not much to report this evening. Um, I do want to let the mayor and council know that um, we are in the process of scheduling interviews for our new city attorney. So um, hopefully that goes well in the next week and we'll have an opportunity for um, our top candidate to engage with the council um, either in a, a meet and greet or maybe in a presentation. So just know that we'll be reaching back out to you all to, to potentially do that. 
and um, we're excited about that. Um, it's been a while, um, not that we don't enjoy working with Walt, but I know he wants to officially retire. Um, and I think we've got a great pool of candidates to select from. Um, we're also going to be posting a lateral police officer posting um, shortly. So I just want to put that out there that we are going to be recruiting in that department as well. Um, and then um, recruiting back a lot of our um, lovely parks and recreation employees who left us during the COVID-19 crisis. So as we begin to reopen, we'll be bringing some of those folks back on board. So that's about all I've got for tonight. Thank you, Kylie. Uh, let's move over to uh, Scott Burke. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just to add a couple of things that we've been up to over in IS. Um, so we're kind of past the hump of getting everybody remote. And now we're moving on to the section where we have a city full of hybrid workers now, which presents a whole set of different challenges. So um, on one side, we've been helping the library get reconfigured for opening up again. We've been running, helping the court run their virtual courtroom, which has gone real well for the last few weeks. Um, we're helping a few different departments with kind of virtual Zoom rooms. And when everybody comes back into work, as you know, people are slowly filtering in offices, they have two devices to, to support, so to speak, and two workspaces. And so we're we're doing our best to balance those two together and, and make those work. And that requires a lot of new hardware, new webcams, new tools for everybody. And we're uh, doing our best to support the mission of each department. Thank you, Scott. And while I'm at the uh, uh, Civic Center, is Matt there? He is here, yes. Stepping up to the mic. Thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Yep, you're fine. Outstanding. Well, just a couple things. Let me start off with, uh, I know I left you last uh, time we met with the proposition that we were going to promote four corporals um, in, uh, in our building the bench of leadership positions. Those four have been identified and they will promote, I believe, the first part of Jan uh, July, excuse me, uh, Officer Eckroth, Officer Newhouse, Officer Peters, and Officer Park are the four that were chosen after uh, nine had a total applied. Uh, very competitive process, we'll put on. Uh, appreciate Kylie's work in HR and uh, the other department heads that worked with us in that uh, promotional process. Do you mind, you, would you guys indulge me for a little bit? Yeah? Absolutely. Okay, great. Hey, well, <clears throat> first of all, um, I think it goes without saying, uh, as the mayor and others have commented, that um, the work that we've done, um, I should say, that was put uh, on by Eva Hales, I think it's important that we note or that I give her uh, uh, her proper uh, kudos because she put on a, a really excellent event uh, Monday of last week, uh, the vigil for uh, Mr. Floyd, uh, and then Tuesday we worked uh, with the high school students. Uh, obviously, it was a much bigger group than just high school. Uh, it, was a, it was a large group of uh, throughout the community. And, and the communication in both those events have been absolutely tremendous. Uh, we work with them and we appreciate their communication and their, their, their ability to sort of um, um, ebb and flow with us, work with us to ensure that our community uh, remains safe and that these uh, uh, vigils or protests, whatever you want to call them, uh, came off without a hitch, and uh, I'm super proud of, uh, of them. Uh, I'm proud of our officers. Uh, you may have seen some of them out there, myself included, um, at them. Uh, so, but indulge me with this because I think it's important that I make a statement, and I, I know some of you maybe had heard this as I spoke uh, after being invited by Eva to provide some police uh, perspective law enforcement uh, perspective with respect to the vigil of Mr. George. Um, so indulge me here, if you will. Um, and again, if you've heard this, I apologize. If you haven't, uh, please bear with me. Um, I want to start off uh, again by reading uh, public condemnation uh, that myself and Mac PD sent out uh, Wednesday following the murder of Mr. Floyd. Uh, this is not who we are. Sorry, I get a little emotional. Uh, or what we stand for. Uh, we have never trained to do this, nor would it ever be acceptable. We will stand with our fellow citizens condemning 
these types of actions by those in law enforcement who act in an improper manner. These types of actions are not reflective of the officers who proudly put on their badge each day to protect and serve their communities day in and day out. We will continue to be there for our city and our citizens and are standing up against the actions that took place in Minneapolis. The McMinnville Police Department has worked very hard to gain the trust of our citizens and our community. We have worked hard at building relationships, developing mutual understanding of one another, and we take the pledge to serve and protect very seriously. We recognize that when situations play out nationally, that they cause people in our community to lose trust in their police department. It goes without saying that the actions that occurred on that Monday withdrew a substantial amount of credit the law enforcement profession had. That being said, I know our officers proudly wear their badges each day and would lay down their lives for this community. The majority of our profession signed up for this job to help the communities and be the garden guardians of the people we serve. Please do not lump us into a category based on the actions of a few. Let's not let these actions, their actions, deter from the value of what we bring to our communities. Unfortunately, the law enforcement community has historically stood silent. That was wrong. We have done a disservice to those we protect and serve, and more importantly, to the persons of color we serve. If true change is going to occur, it's going to take those in leadership roles in law enforcement and all of law enforcement stepping up and leaning into these significant issues. Our silence as a profession has been deafening. Our communities need and expect more from us. They will get more from us. I wanna end with this. I am so proud of the officers of Mac PD. I could go on and on about them. I will go on and on about them, I'm sure, when we talk at more at length as this, uh, as this year goes on. But I want you to know that our department, all everyone that works there, works underneath me, proudly serves this community. We will be there for you in the times that you call. We will be there for everyone, no matter what. You have my promise. And let me tell you this, we will be better. In MAC, we will be better as a profession. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. And if you could just take back to your department how much we appreciate. I think there's been numerous accolades given uh, from counselors this evening, but we have trust in you. Uh, we know that you are looking out for the best interest of this community. Uh, your force puts their lives on the line every single day, and they have a single fo a focus, and that's to protect and to serve this public. And so if you could take that back to your group, uh, we'd appreciate it. And I would say that each and every one of the counselors would, would echo those words also. I will do that. Thank you, Chief. Uh, any, any other department head at, at the Civic Center? Um, I'm just following up on something Councillor Drapkin forgot to mention, which is Congresswoman Bonamici will have three town halls event, um, June 17th at 6 p.m., June 18th at 1 p.m., June 20th at 11 a.m. Um, for more information on these town hall events, um, you can go onto Congresswoman's website. Uh, you can pre-register and ask questions, um, get in line to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Okay, let's continue to move around. Uh, Jennifer, I know you're gonna be on the program a little later, but any reporting that you would have for us? Um, just to let you know, to echo what Scott said, um, the municipal court uh, going through the remote has been going really well and they'll be on their third Wednesday tomorrow and um, we're learning a lot and getting better at it every time. And then just in terms of finance, we do have our auditors on site. They are doing remote interim testing um, this week with us. So that's, that's what's going on with finance. Thank you, Jennifer. 
Um, let's take a look at uh, Heather Richards. Nothing for me tonight, Mayor. Thank you, Heather. Have I overlooked any one of the executive team? I know, Walt, anything that you would have to add for us this evening? Mayor, just a couple of short items. First, I want to, um, uh, in, I want the council to know that uh, Jennifer and Claudia have done a yeoman's work in translating the council's ordinance on campaign finance into the procedures and assistance that candidates need uh, who are just going to be filing for uh, elective office here in the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, and so that, that process is going, is going well. Second, the second item is, is that I believe at your next council meeting you have in your packet a uh, ordinance, excuse me, a contract to update the Visit McMinnville agreement with the city that uh, is uh, acceptable to the representatives of, bo of both um, Visit McMinnville and the city staff uh, so for council consideration. So those are the only two items. Thank you, Walt. Uh, yes. Before I go to Jeff, I'll just ask if Adam was able to rejoin us. Yeah, I'm here. Can okay. you hear me now? Um, it's still a little, a little shaky, but why, why don't you go ahead and try and... Okay. Go ahead. Let me, uh, maybe I'm better now. Yeah, um, yeah, that sounds better. Yeah, so we haven't had an airport commission meeting. ICOM will meet this week and vote on the budget. Um, more than anything, I just wanted to recognize all the work that we as a city have done with our strategic plan and our policies over the last few years on equity and inclusion and, um, you know, the the highlight right now is is on the police department, but I, I think it's system wide and city wide as an organization that we've done a great job and and moving in the right direction. And um, as far as the defund movement for police, I would just urge us as counselors to you know go off data driven decisions and not not emotional ones when it comes to that. I know we're voting on the budget later tonight, so I'll keep the rest of my comments on that till then thank you adam and then we'll end up with jeff jeff um, thank you Mayor. oh looks like claudia needs to talk uh jenny would like to speak oh jenny okay i'm sorry hey, like i said i uh, i don't know if i'm seeing everyone but you're you're bright and clear right now so jenny all right thank you mayor and thank you claudia for interrupting the proceedings um, firstly, uh, I wanted to make a comment about uh, Chief Scales. He started his uh, topic with saying he apologized if, if we'd, we'd heard that before. And I'd just like to say that um, I had heard it before and I was happy to hear it again and I will be happy to hear it again and again. And I'm sure that many people in our community feel the same way. Um, and I also want everyone to know that I am very proud to be part of this city team. And I'm also really proud to be part of this community. I think that everyone has handled themselves very well in this extremely difficult time, all sorts of difficult um, things going on. And I really appreciate the consideration that everybody has been giving one another. Um, and then I also wanna add the good news that the library will be opening. We are um, planning a you know, uh, phased reopening. So um, starting next Tuesday, June 16th, we'll be open Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday for a couple of weeks, and then we'll keep increasing that time period. Uh, we look forward to having people back in the library to do library business. Um, it will be limited service um, in terms of uh, hoping to move people quickly through the library or not quickly, but just keeping the traffic flow going. But it's um, such a treat to be able to serve the community in person again, and we're all looking forward to it. Thanks. 
Thank you, uh, Jenny. Uh, I see that there are a few other uh, on the line. We've got 50 on the line right now. So Jeff, I'm, uh, Chief Lippert is on. So Rich, if you'd like to address the, the group. You're muted if you're talking. And then Mike Bissett, I'll, get, I'll have you get ready. You'll be next. Okay, uh, Mike, why don't we go over to you? Uh, nothing this evening, Mayor, in the interest of your time and your remaining agenda. Okay, thank you, Mike. And I'll call for Chief Lippert uh, if he's on. Okay, I think Jeff, we're ready for you. I think Chief Lightford is attending two meetings at the same time. He did indicate he didn't have anything specific to okay. it when I spoke with him earlier. Um, is first of all, I just want to say how proud I am of all of the members of the executive team and the rest of the team here at the city of McMinnville. I want to thank the council and the community for their support and encouragement for us to do well and to do better. Uh, a brief report tonight on just a couple of routine things. Um, uh, just a reminder that the June 17th work session next week has been canceled. Uh, it should disappear from your calendars within the next 24 hours if it hasn't already. Uh, you also saw a note from Claudia earlier this week uh, attempting to schedule a special work session on June 30th. And for those of you who've responded, thank you. If you have not yet, um, looking forward to having your response to Claudia. And uh, Jennifer will clarify this as we move into the public hearings. Uh, we're certainly interested in council um, discussion and, and guidance as appropriate. Uh, tonight's not the night to adopt the budget. However, that's scheduled for your next council meeting. Okay. Hearing that, then uh, the last item in advice and informational items is our cash and investment report from November 2019. That is a part of our packet. And I see the chief is on. So uh, chief, if you'd like to uh, have any words for the council. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, um, just a short snapshot. Uh, we've been pushing really hard to get the consolidation uh, study completed so that uh, the consultants can be here for June 30th, July 1st, and July 2nd. They'll be here for two and a half days of uh, intensive work sessions with a variety of groups, including Council. Um, and uh, they'll take uh, your questions, concerns at that point back and work it into the uh, um, the um, plan uh, and be back to us by the August 1st with the uh, final product. And the other thing that is out there still is um, we had uh, loan chief Hannafin to Dundee for uh, what we thought was going to be a short period of time and the investigation has turned out to be a little longer than we anticipated. So we'll be, uh, we'll, we have uh, worked with the city manager that we're going to leave her in pocket um, through the initial uh, consolidation study and then we'll uh, provide the city council of Dundee some options at that point uh, either for assistance to get an interim chief or to um, uh, contract with us for some something different than what we're doing right now thank you chief appreciate all that you're doing okay uh, that will take us to the scheduled public hearing uh, this evening and we are uh, going to have a public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2020-2021 budget as approved by the budget committee. And so uh, I will uh, um, open the public hearing and ask our uh, finance director, Jennifer, uh, to, uh, to present. And then the city um, manager may also make some comments. So uh, we'll, we'll turn to Jennifer first, then Jeff, and then open for public testimony. Jennifer. Um, yeah, good evening, Mayor and Councilors and members of the public. So this is a budget hearing. This is the opportunity for the Mayor and City Councilors to hear from the public. Uh, this is a statutory requirement um, in Oregon uh, local budget law. And this happens after the meeting of the budget committee, which did take place on May 18th. They approved the budget and the a summary of the budget was published in the, um, the local newspaper. 
and that uh, publishing happened on May 29th. And so now is the opportunity for um, public comment. And also we had, because of um, COVID-19 and the public health emergency, we also utilized um, a web-based mechanism to take public testimony um, from folks. And we have, um, there were over 20 people who, who um, gave public testimony through the website. I know many more than that sent direct emails and Claudia has pulled together all of that information for the public record. So that is also part of uh, your public testimony. And so at this point, um, I'll just step back and I think Claudia will be managing any um, folks who are here either on the phone or in person to make, um, make their, their testimony heard here tonight. And Jennifer, just to clarify, as Jeff had mentioned, tonight all we're doing is a public hearing, giving the community an opportunity to weigh in on the budget, uh, and we'll just listen to them, and then we'll bring back the formalized approval of the budget by City Council at a later date. Is that correct? Um, yes, that is correct. And um, it will be the last Tuesday of June when the budget will be before you for um, appropriation for your vote. And if I'm not if I'm not mistaken on my uh, on my notes tonight, again, we're not as a council having discussion. We'll wait that for the evening where we approve the budget, correct? Correct, yes. I just wanted to clarify that for the council so that you were aware. So again, tonight is an opportunity for the public to weigh in on public uh, comments, which is a statutory, a statutory requirement of the state. So with that being said, I'm going to open up the public testimony. And, uh, and again, as Jennifer indicated, we have tremendous number of emails and information or uh, testimony that was received through the website. And so those are all a part of the record with name and what they've shared with us. So I'll turn it over to Claudia for anyone that on the line or anyone in a uh, city call that would like to testify. Mr. Mayor? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I just have a, a question related to the process. Um, and this is really more for future benefit than for the current time. This is for Jennifer. Is there a specific timeline in statute for when um, public comment has to be taken? Um, I'm, I'm wondering if we're allowed to take public comment, um, for example, prior to the budget um, committee meeting. Um, and, and the reason for that is I feel like the process might be better informed if we had the public commenting earlier rather than more towards the end um, going forward. And so I didn't know if that was something that the statute requires us to accept the comment only after the budget committee presents its report or if, if there's more flexibility than that. Um, well, so Walt may want to jump in, but there is a public comment portion at the budget committee meetings. So we did take public comment during that process as well. The budget hearing is particularly called out. Um, just the timing is it needs to happen between the approval at the budget committee and prior to the ultimate adoption of the budget by um, the governing body. So in terms of gathering public comment ahead of meetings, um, that is allowed under statute, but in, during the public health emergency, the governor did um, issue an executive order mandating that opportunities for um, public comment be, um, uh, be beefed up in this um, situation so that people wouldn't have to make a choice about coming physically to a meeting, but could weigh in ahead of time. So we added the, um, the web form um, in response to what the governor asked us to do this cycle. Um, but there's no reason why we wouldn't keep, keep doing it um, in future years. So 
does that go to your question? Yeah, my, my question was about the, the timing of the, what, the testimony we're getting tonight, and you gave that to me. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, sure. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Jennifer. And so uh, we're now ready for public testimony, and so we'll turn it over to Claudia. We'll start with Mark Davis. Mark, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, I think I'm going to take this off. You might be able to hear me a little better. Uh, Mark Davis, 652 Southeast Washington Street. Um, I've already commented in detail at your budget committee hearing and, and submitted inf information in writing. I'm not going to go over all that. I'm going to restrict my comments to one issue at this point. Um, which is, the res is your reserve policy. Um, you know, with all that's going on in this country right now, I, I, I even debated about whether getting, it was worth getting up here to say something. Um, but, you know, at some point, the federal government's gonna stop printing money, the state government's gonna stop issuing executive orders, and the city of McMinnville is gonna be left to figure out how do we handle public safety? You know, how do we, we deal with the economic uh, downturn that seems inevitable and it seems to me that that's going to be end up in the lap of the city in, in a lot of ways and you know if we're going to be able to deal with those problems I think we need money and I'm just concerned that this budget is leaving us with an inadequate reserve um, I was going to read in detail but we have a lot of people here tonight I, I think the last three years I've been the only people's person speaking on the budget I'm really happy to see that the public has showed up and I hope some of them will come forward and speak to you also but in, in, to give more time for other people, I'm not gonna read all this, but I just wanna remind the council that you approved a policy, a, a fund balance policy for the general fund back in 2011. And I'll read a couple of brief things. One, this policy establishes a fund balance goal for the general fund is an intended to serve as a guide for important budgetary decisions made by the city council budget committee and management. And it goes on to list some criteria, but the, the key point here is Generally, 25% of general fund annual expenditures provides an adequate cash reserve to cover operating expenditures from July through October. Now, I don't know if 25% is correct. I've certainly heard 17%. I know we're operating at a different number with this budget, a much lower number. Um, I <clears throat> appreciate the memo that the finance director provided in your packet regarding the calculation. I would hope in the future that we would see that calculation actually in the budget so citizens could see what our reserve total actually is. This, that, that memo shows that we have $2.6 million in reserves in the budget, $1.9 million in contingency, $0.6 million in money that's basically set aside for the volunteer firefighters, and $100,000 in actual cash that's going to be left if the contingency and the other money was used. The other 1.1 to 1.5 million dollars in the the um, that's shown there for as part of the calculation is a projection about what might happen this year, um, and the the actual in my estimation the actual reserve at this point in the budget, not with counting that extra million million and a half, which is in my mind speculative, is actually nine percent. So the budget that the budget committee recommended to you only has a reserve of 9%. You have a policy saying it should be 25%. You have a, a government finance officers association recommendation of 17% and, and you're significantly below that. The, the ending balance is gonna depend on three things. One, the beginning fund balance. And that's gonna obviously depend on the ending fund balance in the current fiscal year with all the disruption that's going on. We don't know what's going on. Hopefully we'll get some of that money that the federal government is printing and that will help increase the size of that ending fund balance so that we can carry it over. But we don't know that that's gonna happen. Then the second thing we can get is savings in the, in the current budget. And that's what's been estimated to be one to one and a half million dollars. And the final thing that we'd have to do is not spend any of the contingency money. And it seems to me that in the current situation that we're in, that all these, having all three of these things work out in a positive way is highly unrealistic. And I'm fearful that we're gonna wind up with even less money in our reserve than we started out with. 
I also have a problem with the council failing to identify what the one million to one and a half million dollars in cuts are. I mean, what, where are you going to take it from? Public safety? Are you going to take it from, you know, parks, the library? I mean, I think there ought to be a public discussion. This is a, you're adopting a budget and you're counting on that, that million, million and a half. We should be hearing where that money's coming from. <clears throat> and, and I should also mention that the reserve policy specifically mentions that one of the reasons we try to remain, maintain a high reserve is so that we have a good bond rating. We have this MACPAC committee out there busy working, talking about, you know, ultimately coming up with some facility recommendation that's going to take a bond measure. If we have low reserves, I mean, they're not going to care about our projections. They're going to be looking at the actual numbers. And if we don't have actual numbers to show them that, that you know, we have the reserves, I, I fear for our bond rating. <clears throat> the, the other thing to, to remember in this process is that our tax revenue depends on the, the tax base that the, the assessor gives us each year. We're estimating this year we're going to get a 4% increase. If we look at past history, the last recession, 2008, it took a couple of years before that number started dropping. And so we're setting ourselves, we're already at a low point and we're setting ourselves up for the possibility that we might be looking at 2% or 1% increase in that tax base in a future year. So we don't, where are we gonna get the money to cover our reserves? So what in the end, I guess I would like to suggest that the council revisit that the memo or the, the policy they, they established in 2011 and decide what the number is. I'm not saying that I know what the number is, but I'm asking you to, to tell the public what the number is. If it's not 25%, is it 17%, whatever percent you're gonna settle on, let's settle on the number and then we can all look at the calculation and see whether the budget meets that number or not, instead of having these philosophical arguments of the budget committee. And then the other thing I'd like to ask is I, I provided you the Government Finance Officers Association recommendation, and on the second page of that, in use and replenishment, it states, the fund balance policy should define conditions warranting, warranting its use, and if a fund balance falls below the government's policy level, a solid plan to replenish it. And I think that's what we're really lacking here is, okay, you know, this is a, this is a crisis, it appears like it's time to dip into that balance, but what's the plan? I mean, what, you know, how are we gonna get that money back? And, and I realize there's a lot of uncertainty and you're gonna deal with this in six months, but I think the time to start dealing with it is now. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Next. Uh, we'll have Caleb Bolivlov. Caleb Blipka, a um, community member. I live over by the high school. I work at the hospital. Uh, I just want to say to the mayor and the council and the attendees that, first of all, I, um, I, I'm here to voice my unequivocal support for uh, defunding, deconstructing, and transforming the McMinnville Police Department into um, an interagency, um, well-integrated, community policing model. And I, I don't think I'm alone in that. I do also want to push back slightly at perhaps the unintended implication that uh, this movement towards this sort of transformation is not data or evidence driven. I think uh, notably you've, you've, you've seen highlights in major publications of departments that have successfully done this or to an extent done this and um, seen great results uh, in their, in their uh, internal data. Um, I also recognize that that, that movement and the, and the push to do this is, uh, a lot of it is outside of the purview of a budget discussion. Um, stuff like uh, setting up uh, public oversight committees uh, for department affairs and, and incidents is, is not gonna happen here. Um, stuff like the problematic arbitration clauses, which I think are in police union contracts, which I think is particularly poignant for our community as we've, we've seen arbitration clauses uh, have an effect here in our apartment. Uh, that's, that's outside of the purview of this discussion as well. Uh, but I, I do think, and I appreciate uh, Chief Scales coming up and in, in, in voicing a, 
a sentiment of, of commitment to doing better and being better. And I also sensed uh, overtones of a desire for community policing and a different public safety model and some previous comments by, by council members. Uh, I, I appreciate that. And I just ask that uh, the council and the department in looking at approving this budget um, consider what substantive measures are can be can be seen in the, the proposed fiscal year 20 and 21 budget that would move towards that goal of um, transforming the department into a more robust community policing model and uh, I would ask that the police uh, department proposed budget be combed through uh, line by line and uh, each item be considered and weighed as to whether or not it, it moves towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. And um, next we have Kel Hughes. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, thank you, Mayor, City Council. Um, I'm Carol Hughes. I'm at 325 Southeast Baker Street. I emailed several of you, I think most of you, this afternoon. Um, I've lived in McMinnville for the last two years. Uh, I, I moved to Oregon after I got out of the military, where I had spent about a total of about 22 years in military service. So the first half of it was in the Marine Corps Reserve, and I also worked law enforcement for four years in eastern Oklahoma. Um, I, I want to say that coming to McMinnville, um, I felt very welcome here. Uh, Chief Scales, the things that he has posted on Facebook and the words that he has shared mean a great deal to me because they reflect my values. They reflect everything that I believe and they reflect everything that I think law enforcement stands for. Um, it's, it's incredible to have a leader like that in his position and it's something that should never be overlooked. In the time that I was in the military, I stayed apolitical most of the time. Um, you know, that's, that's our job. We just, we keep our heads down and protect everybody. It doesn't matter. Since I've been out, I've seen some in incredibly prideful things and I've seen some very disturbing things and I can't be silent anymore. Um, a little over a week ago, I saw a video of a man struggling for breath and the look of apathy on a police officer. Um, at that moment, he was no longer a police officer. He was a murderer. And a little part of my soul broke. And I, I couldn't be silent anymore. And I wanted to speak. I wanted to act. I wanted to do anything. I've seen the requests, the demands to defund the police. Um, those things are unfortunate. Uh, I, I think the law enforcement community has an incredible amount of responsibility and pressure put on them by people who see a very myopic perspective of what officers experience on a daily basis. I've, I've been on both sides. I've looked over the sights of a 45 at a man pointing a shotgun at me. I know what it's like to wear a badge. I know what it's like to wear a uniform. And this is a time where we all have to have some perspective. We have to listen to each other. We have to listen. We have to understand. And it's not just about being right. It's about doing what's best to support our nation, to support each other, and to support Americans, not Republicans or Democrats, conservatives or liberals. We are Americans. And that's how we need to look at this. And that's how we need to, to focus on this. I reached out to you this afternoon because I want to do something. I have to do something more than post ridiculously on Facebook and get into arguments with people and challenge their ideologies. I want to volunteer to do anything possible to serve the, the council, the police department, to volunteer for, uh, as I, I, I spoke with Zach, about a public review board for the police department about looking into other methods to approach situations. I used the analogy earlier that when there's a car accident, you have the police, the fire department, and the EMTs that show up. 
each one of those responding agencies has their own responsibility in that situation. When you have a domestic disturbance and somebody calls 911, usually you just get the police. There's no equivalent for an emotional fire or a mental health crisis. And there's something that needs to be said about that. I think it's, it's unfair the pressure that's placed on law enforcement and it's unrealistic that they're equipped and capable of handling all of the situations that they face on an everyday basis in social crises. I know that we've got a long way to go um, and people want solutions. They want immediate solutions. They want it fixed right now. And what I see in a lot of people is a whole lot of passion and a lot of emotion. And that is a, a ground that is ripe for planting knee jerk reactions that get us into situations where we have unsustainable policies that intertwine and can't be undone. And now, more than any other time, it is absolutely important to stop and take a step back, take a deep breath, approach it as a group, and work towards realistic solutions and long-term solutions. And I volunteer for that. I'd, I'd be perfectly happy to be involved in something like that. But I think that's what we need to focus on. And I appreciate you giving me the time to speak and to say that part of it. Um, and I look forward to continuing to be as active as I can be in the community and play a role in helping us all move forward together because that's where we're best and that's where we're strongest. And I hope that we stay that way. Thank you. Thank you, Kale. And uh, thank you for your thoughtful email uh, to the council. Next, we have Mallory Stiff on Zoom. We'll unmute your mic. You're muted, uh, Claudia. Sorry about that. Um, next, we have Mallory Stiff, who's on Zoom, so we'll unmute her mic. Okay, it's unmuted. Mallory, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me, and thank you for holding this meeting. Um, I have a few, a couple different questions slash comments um for you all tonight so i'm just wondering since the city of mcminnville um has a vision of a quote a collaborative and caring city inspiring an exceptional quality of life i'm wondering if we can advocate for a redistribution of police funding to create new departments that would support community health through mediation and mental health supports for example, we could have community peace coaches that are ingrained in the communities to lead and educate citizens on de-escalation techniques, conflict management, and effective communication. And if you can't tell, I'm a social worker in the community. Um, my second comment is if we do continue to fund police in any capacity, as a mental health provider, I've noticed that police are frequently impacted by trauma and by stress to a high degree. Um, and I'm wondering why there has not been a policy created to include required mental health supports embedded within the police department in order to ensure the mental health of those who are carrying weapons in public on a daily basis. And I'm saying like, as a requirement for police officers to see a mental health provider on a regular basis in order to maintain their mental health and a capacity to actually serve our community in a positive manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mallory, for your comments. Uh, next, we have Rachel Card. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I have, a, I have a question. Are we able to direct questions to staff at, the, at this time? During this, I know you. Yeah, we're just taking public testimony, Zach. If I'm not mistaken, Walt, you can weigh in on this. But this is taking public testimony, and so we can take notes and have a discussion later, or we could reach out to staff through Jeff because uh, uh, we've got people's names and how to get a hold of them. Am I right, Walt? 
I think if, if you're taking public testimony, that's what you do. At the point you've closed the public testimony, the council can deliberate, ask questions of staff. Uh, I know that that's not programmed for tonight, but certainly uh, the council could choose to do that tonight or some of that tonight if they wish or or do it as programmed at the next meeting. Thank you. Claudia. Hi. Again, who do we have? My name is Rachel Karstensen. Rachel, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for hearing me. So I recently heard a metaphor that really resonated with me. It spoke about our community leaders as tools within a toolbox. Right now, I feel that our police department is considered the entire toolbox when we could think of each community leader and each area of our community as being useful. To quote Alicia Garza, activist, author, and co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, we are asking police to be domestic violence counselors. We're asking police to be therapists. We're asking police to deal with people who are in crisis in terms of their mental health. And police are not trained to do that. And in fact, sure, we could spend a bunch of time training people with badges and guns to be able to respond differently to that, and maybe we should. But we also have people whose actual profession it is to do that work. And so if you actually limit what police do in our communities and how often they come into contact with our people, and for what, that is actually the key to saving more lives. As long as you also invest on the other side in making sure that there is a robust set of resources that people can access, that they won't be criminalized for accessing, but also where you don't have the option for a mistake of trying to deal with a mental health crisis and you shoot someone. I see in your proposed budget that there is a decrease in the police funding by 0.38%. While this is better than an increase, this is not enough. Over the last three years, the McMinnville PD has seen an increase of over 1.5 million in their allocated budget. The current proposed budget, 9.3 million, is more than our Parks and Rec, Library, Finance, Planning, and Municipal Court budgets combined. I believe this is disproportionate to our city's needs. I urge you to please divest from our police and invest in our community in ways that truly serve and protect us. And also, I would like to speak to what Mallory was saying earlier um, and second her great idea about peace coaches um, and also um, funding into social workers like herself. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. We have Christopher Anderson on Zoom, so we will unmute his mic. Christopher, welcome. Hello, thank you for having me. Uh, I spoke earlier, um, and I'd like to have that. Um, I live here on McMinnville, 1880 Southwest Fellows. Um, I like uh, what I said earlier, and we also entered in follow up on this. Um, uh, and I would like to second what both Mallory and um, Rachel. Um, said earlier um, in regards to putting so eloquently how um, looking over the budget um, is it's, it's quite it, it's quite upsetting to see that we are spending 9.3 million dollars on, on on our police force and that's 29 percent of our budget um, in comparison, I cannot see, and I'm missing it maybe because I don't know budget reports or how to read them correctly, but I don't see any funding or where the funding is um, except for housing, um, which is $300,000 for ha affordable housing projects. I mean, if this is how our budgeting is treating um, <laughs> It's disproportionately uh, affecting a lot of people if we're putting $9 million and only giving 300000 to housing projects. 
I mean, I, I probably not reading it correctly. Um, but I would like to put this out for a challenge and to our chief of police to forgo 1.5 million of his budget to put that towards funding um, what Mallory and Rachel have both suggested in that we start task force and start community health and mental health um, support teams in order to act as the first line of uh, responders, much like our EMTs do. Uh, and again, um, that, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Next, we have Vanessa via Zoom, um, and we will unmute her mic. Thank you. Vanessa, welcome. Vanessa, welcome. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to th say thank you to the city council members for everyone in attendance, as well as um, everyone virtually, physically, everyone protesting, as well as our police force. Um, I had a few key comments that I wanted to make, and we'll keep this to under three minutes for sure. Uh, the for, and first of all, I am a homeowner and a business owner here in McMinnville, just to provide some context. So. First of all, I just wanted to reiterate a point that I think is becoming more and more clear, but I think it's worth reiterating that the word defund is sometimes questionable. Uh, defund doesn't mean remove all funding. Defund uh, from the police does simplistically mean redistributing funds to other endeavors as well. Um, so I think that's just something very clear that we need to be sharing broadly and widely uh, so people don't feel that it means taking away all police funding and rights whatsoever. Um, second of all, and to mimic much of what Mallory, Rachel, and Christopher have already said, that with an annual budget of $31 million to allocate $9 million towards the police, a full third of our budget, uh, even in someone not in the police force, is pretty astronomical and, and pretty jarring, uh, especially considering that's more than even the, the fire department is allocated. I did want to provide just some data in a different way. I'm kind of a data geek. Uh, I did some quick math, and that kind of funding towards the police uh, averages in, in a population of about 33,000 people that McMinnville has. That averages about $272 per, per resident, per citizen of this county or this town uh, allocated towards the police, so $272. Um, you know, meanwhile, we have County Commissioner Mary Starrett, who is has publicly bemoaned uh, funding diversity and equity inclusion uh, training to the tune of less than $20,000 of our city's budget. Uh, just seems like a huge inequity. Um, again, $272 towards the police versus an average of 58 cents per person for DEI training. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that, that the gross uh, difference there. Um, and then thirdly, I, I just wanted to kind of speak to uh, nobody here wants our city to be unsafe. Nobody here wants our city to be overrun by anyone defying the law. But if we're not willing to invest in preventative and proactive measures to prevent some of these things from having, then our city as a whole and our budget is going to be extremely sacrificed. Um, you know, looking at the amount of money that's brought in, not only by tourism, I think $1.2 million in transient tax, the tourism that comes to our town, uh, but secondarily, all of the, the budget and the funding and the revenue that comes to our local businesses and our community, we can't afford a PR crisis such as what's happened in, in Minneapolis. And that's not to say that's the only reason, but if we can do these pro proactive measures and preventative measures in a way that's extremely less costly than the long reaching and never ending impact of those types of actions, then we're doing a disservice to our town, a town that I know has values that are committed towards community and life and happiness and all of those beautiful things. So uh, I just wanted to highlight again, the, the tangible and intangible costs that come with not diverting funds towards things that can prevent these horrible things from even happening. And that's all I have. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Vanessa. Oh. 
next we have Boone McCoy Chris. I stay in my three minutes. I... Hello, uh, my name is Boone. I um, am a community member here in McMinnville. I live on Cowell Street and very simply would like to just add my voice and uh, reinforce the statements of many members of the community who have already spoken uh, very eloquently and I think very meaningfully towards a very strong and uh, deeply felt reflection in the community on the idea that nearly a third of the general fund budget is proposed to go to the police department. Um, I think that there is a very strong sense in the community that that inaccurately reflects how uh, many people in the town feel about where the safety in their community comes from and how they reflect on it. I don't necessarily think that the opinion of many people who live in this town would be that that is how they would like money to be invested in their safety and in their community. Um, I say that very anecdotally and very personally, uh, but again, I'm mostly speaking to re-invoice, re reinforce and revoice many things already said, I think very eloquently by Rachel, Mallory, Christopher, and, um, and Caleb. I, uh, I thank you for your time and um, would again simply like to say that in accordance with the comments made by Police Chief Scales, uh, the most meaningful action the police department could take towards his comments would be to cede those funds back to the community to be redistributed in more creative ways. Thank you very much. Pierce, who's on Zoom, will unmute your mic. Hello there, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Hey, okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you for holding the meeting and thank you for taking time for public comment. So like many of the people that have already spoken, I also would like to urge the budget to be reconsidered specifically to defund the police. I would ask that people view this in very much the same way that people view the divest campaign for climate change. Don't get hung up on the word defund. Of course, there are people calling for abolishment, and that is a step that is sometimes relevant in certain communities. In this community, there seems to be a large number of people that are committed to real work. It sounds like the chief is committed to real work, and that's really wonderful. But true commitment oftentimes lies in the dollar. And if we continue to invest in more and more trainings for police, as opposed to equipping other community organizations with useful funds, we're just gonna continue going down this same slope that so many communities before us have gone down. So I would really urge and ask that people be very creative, look into the budget and find out why we need to have so much of that. And, and I know that there's other things that the city's spending money on, one of the figures that was brought to my attention, like many people crash coursing on trying to figure out how to read a budget, is how much of our property taxes go straight into the general fund. And so that means that much of the money that we as property, I own a, I own a home here with my wife in McMinnville, that we're paying is going directly into this general fund. And so it is an incredibly important part for us to voice our opinion on. And I encourage all of the council people and all the people in city official positions to welcome this and to encourage people to get more involved and to ask for more comment and for people to really participate more in civic engagement because what we're hearing is that a lot of people are very confused as to why so much of the general fund is allocated towards police there are many other creative ways there are many other great organizations in town that are already operating that could use those funds as well as one of the other gentlemen brought up, the potential for sustainable housing or affordable housing rather that was in the budget was that 300,000, but that was only if we had a positive balance at mid-year. And so again, that just seems like a absurdly off number. That we have 9.3 million for police, but we have maybe just $300,000 if we have a positive balance. Again, I could be misreading the budget, but I would echo that sentiment. Involved in this, I would also 
please, please, please take into account that I don't see much in this budget for climate action and addressing one of the pending catastrophes of our time and how this is incredibly linked to social justice and that if we don't provide a safe and healthy community in all holistic ways, we are going to be ending up in a very bad situation. So yes, right now, defunding the police and using those horses towards community resources to help our black indigenous people of color communities is incredibly essential. And then also to tie that into a direct take on climate action is essential. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for hearing the comments and that's it. Thank you, Tynan. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, with that, uh, with that being uh, announced, uh, I will now close the public testimony on uh, on the budget. And um, our next area is going to be the proposed uses of state uh, revenue sharing for fiscal year 2020, 2021, and we'll go through that public uh, that public hearing, and then. Sure. Our I'm, I'm sorry, I just I just want to interject because we have a lot of people in the audience and in the room and every time we have one of these things and we don't acknowledge that people have been heard and listened to and understood, um, people feel that way. They feel like they haven't been heard and understood. So I just want to acknowledge that the members on our council hear the people in the audience. We understand what you're saying. And it's the policy of our council to really not comment on public comments. And that's the reason why people are not commenting from this side of the dais. It's not necessarily that we don't agree or that we're not listening. It's just that that's not the norm for us. So I just wanted to explain that for the folks in the room. Sorry for interrupting you, Mayor. Thank you, Sal. And so again, we'll go through the state revenue sharing piece, and then we'll go through that public hearing because we may have people in the audience. And then I'll come to the council and see if we want to have a little discussion or hold that off for our uh, budget deliberations at the later date. So uh, I am going to open uh, the public. Uh, well, I'm going to read a statement first. And uh, the state revenue share, uh, sharing law ORS 221.770 requires city to annually pass an ordinance or resolution uh, re uh, requesting state revenue sharing money. In order to receive uh, state revenue sharing in 2020-2021, a city must have levied property taxes in the preceding year and hold a public hearing before the budget committee uh, and uh, for possible uses of the funds and hold a hearing uh, before the city council on the proposed uses of the funds in relationship to the entire budget. We've had that uh, public hearing before the budget committee when we met as a budget committee, uh, but now we're going to open uh, for a public hearing on the proposed uses of state shared revenue. And so I'll turn to Jennifer to present uh, what we're going to be doing and then we'll open the the well i'll open the public hearing right now and then ask jennifer just to present um yes good evening again so um thank you mayor for laying out all of the statutory requirements here and why we're um, having this hearing so in terms of what's being um, proposed here this is unchanged from um, the document that the budget committee received um, earlier in May and gives um, essentially examples of the kinds of things that um, our state shared funding would be utilized for. So it, um, there are items throughout the organization that are on this list. So that's... Um, and then Jennifer... I would mm -hmm. ask you to remind the council the dollar amount that we're looking at through the shared uh, revenue with the state. The, the total amount that we're estimating for next year is $563,000. Okay. So at this point, I guess it's open for public um, testimony. So 
So we'll open up uh, the public hearing and again, any public testimony specifically on the use of state revenue sharing, uh, which as uh, Jennifer indicated was five, uh, uh, 563,000. So I'll turn it over to Claudia. have not had anyone sign up or request to speak so far. Okay. Then I will go ahead and close the public hearing uh, on the state revenue sharing for fiscal year 2020-2021. Uh, it is uh, now almost nine o'clock. We have a couple of other items to to discuss, but I would like to just open it up to the council is if they are wanting to uh, share some thoughts or dialogue this evening, or if we want to reserve that when we come back to deliver, deliberate and approve the budget. So I'll just kind of open it up and see what your, what your thoughts might be. I guess I'll go first since nobody else is jumping in. I, I think that we should have a little bit of a conversation tonight in light of the large amount of folks who came to testify, at the very least to hash out the ideas. Um, and, and if there's any change in direction uh, that the council suggests that that would give staff the time to do that ahead of the next budget meeting. So I think we should talk at least. And, and we're open for that. Uh, so uh, again, um, you know, uh, we've received a lot of testimony via email and most of that has uh, come to the council and uh, many of us have spent uh, at least a good hour forwarding all of that off, off to Claudia so that she could make that a part of the record. I know I started last night and, and uh, there was a lot of forwarding going on. Uh, so uh, again, there's a lot of testimony, whether it be written or eloquently shared with us in the public hearing. So any any comments? The, the first comment that I would have is not related to the um, Black Lives Matter movement, but to pretty much everything Mark Davis had to say. Um, I found myself, at, of course, I was the, the voice probably in the budget committee that was pushing on that as well, but I, I, I think that we should be concerned about the long-term economic ramifications of uh, this COVID-19 and I am concerned that we did not do enough in the budget to strip out non-discretionary spending items, even though I know that probably those will get dealt with later on. Um, and and I, I, I am concerned that, uh, that we're gonna have more severe cuts later on by not taking a more cautious approach up front. Um, with respect to the to the Black Lives Matter comments and the questions about defunding the police. Um, I think a lot of people in the public, you know, probably don't realize that the process for developing the budget um, happens primarily by our staff, uh, that it's a pretty lengthy process uh, that takes several months and involves, of course, hundreds and hundreds of household lives, uh, people who are earning an income um, and so while I think it is important to have a conversation about ways that we can reform the police first with things that are maybe in line with what the chief already ha is doing, uh, and second, maybe starting a conversation so that we can look to uh, different models for policing. And before the, at the last budget committee meeting and during some of the conversations that we've had about the fire and public safety, I've been in favor of, of a levy uh, to fund additional staffing positions. And my thought with the levy was that we could use that to potentially hire, um, you know, uh, social workers uh, to, to be working with the police and doing crisis calls. I know that Officer Height and our mental health officers are already doing some of that with the county, but expanding that kind of service on a going forward basis does make some sense to me. Uh, and a lot of the comments around uh, trying to do more to fund uh, community services, I, I also find myself sympathetic to. So I, I don't think it's something that we should be trying to do on a last minute or short term basis, but I do think that we should start the conversation that people have asked us to uh, engage in and uh, you know, be proactive in 
addressing the concerns that were raised tonight. Thank you, Sal. Any other comments? Um, I'm not going to belabor it, but. And just briefly, uh, in regard to Mark's comments, uh, I must admit that honestly, there was a few things that really rang a bell with me. And one of them is uh, we've been kind of up in the air about 25%, 17%, whatever. It would be good to memorialize what we think is the proper uh, reserve that we should have. And then take some constructive steps as to discussing how we might get back to that at some point, you know, and what's a reasonable time. Uh, I just feel like those are proactive steps that the council could take that would be appropriate for policy. Um, I'll, I'll say a few things as well. Uh, one, and I think, you know, one of the concerns we have regarding our budget shortfall right now is of course we don't really know what our budget shortfalls are going to be. This, um, the the demands that are coming in, um, uh, the idea that we'll be re receiving um, state or federal money when uh, those budgets are really uh, highly uncertain. Um, it'll be really interesting when quarterly uh, taxes are. Um, uh, our, our com this quarter's uh, quarterly taxes are coming in, and, and, and of course there just will be a, um, a, a huge shortfall there, and, and, and of course a trickle trickle down effect. So we, we have a um, uh, in a way this is the most complicated budget we've we've ever encountered, uh, or, or I've encountered. Um, uh, um, I will say. Um, uh, I, I do also hear the public uh, outcry to go, uh, somebody said go through the um, police budget with a fine tooth comb. Um, and um, I mean, I think that, that that is part of the process that we do go through is going through the entire budget with a fine tooth comb, but it also in, um, it, in light of the recent public request for that, um, I, I, that is, I mean, I will certainly be doing that, um, uh, going back through the budget um, uh, for another evaluation. Um, I, I do want to say that um, we do have to have uh, plans um, present and ready uh, and, and that are actionable for how we deal with community concerns. Um, so for instance, um, uh, we need to have, um, I, I, I'm going to save the rest of my comments for, for, for our next meeting when, when we're, when we're deliberating, but I, the, the idea of, um, massive transitions right now without plans in place to address real community concerns that could leave our community vulnerable is at the top of my mind. Um, and I will uh, add my voice uh, again to what Mark and, and what Kelly said, we've, we've, our reserve has been steadily declining. Um, there's some, some things with that that are really, uh, at this point, beyond our control to a degree. Um, and those raise some huge questions for us going forward. Um, and we do need to be thinking about this budget um, in terms of the uh, recession, in terms of being in a recession. And um, it's a... Mm -hmm. No, somebody disagrees. Somebody said, mm -mm. "No, that was just feedback." <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Because who doesn't think we're going into a recession? <laughs> Those are fighting words, Remy. Anyways, not the R word, dude. So Remy, was that the end of your comments? I, I have more to say, but I think there'll be more, some of the things that are more specific, I, I would like to um, do what the community has asked, which is uh, to go back through the budget again with this new lens of um, uh, COVID implications, which we really only had that 
we've only had a review of the budget once with COVID considerations. Um, and, you know, I felt as though our city manager addressed that pretty thoroughly in his last budget presentation about the adaptability um, of our budget and, and that, um, it, you know, we it, it's not that it was unaddressed, but uh, I think in light of not just COVID, but in light of all of the other um, things that have unfolded over the past number of weeks and the, the questions that are being asked by the community that um, it deserves, the, our, the, but the community deserves us as um, the body that would approve this budget to go back through once again um, and, and, and really take a close look. And so uh, I'll be doing that. Um, and then I'll save the rest of my comments for uh, when we deliberate. Thank you, Remy. Uh, Wendy? Um, so I agree with a lot of what the other counselors have said so far. I think the I do hear the citizens that they want us to what as Remy was saying, they want us to take a closer look at uh, the the budget in before we move forward with it. I think that's a totally reasonable request, and I think that it's it's um, that I will also be doing the same before our deliberations. I do think that the, the scope of change that they're talking about is something that would not happen. At, it, we, can, we can look at evaluating what, what, we, what opportunities we have and we can start moving in that direction, but it's definitely not a pivot. It's a quick pivot. It's something that would take time to evaluate and then make plans and then shift from one thing to another and evaluate where the resources, how are those needs to be covered. So there's a lot, it's a process change that is a systemic change that takes time. So um, so it would be, it would not be something I'd be comfortable with just stripping money out of the budget for this budget, um, talking about this budget, it's not a quick change. That being said, um, I also have some concerns about um, what Mark brought up, and I uh, I would like more clarity around. Okay, what is our target? And um, maybe I don't know if it's appropriate for Jennifer to give us some background on any additional information she has uh, about what she's seeing um, financially in with regards to COVID since the last time we had our meeting, and she she presented on that, and then also maybe her response to Mark's specific testimony and his submitted testimony, would it be appropriate for her to give us some of her thoughts now so that we can consider it as we're reviewing the budget again before our next deliberations? That or have her just uh, maybe look into our concerns and get it out to us in a written fashion sure. prior but to- She supposedly did do some form of, uh, of a, a, a response and I, I myself have not found it yet. So I'm just kind of waiting. Yeah. I think you're right. We had it in there. It was one sheet. I feel like it wasn't quite as as comprehensive as I would like to see. Um, I would tend to agree. Yeah, so. I, I'm hearing that we have a resolution that puts us at a reserve of 25%, and we've been off of that. And you know, we've always talked about getting back to it. But if that is not the number, what is the number? And so let's be realistic about what we're headed towards. And then if we go through COVID and have a downturn, then we know what to work back towards. And that, that higher number that may not be realistic today, it might be 17, it might be 15. I don't know what that number is, but it does warrant us to have a, a better discussion and not go with a resolution that has us at 25%. Because if we were to do a scorecard on that, we would have failed. And also the comment that Mark made about uh, having a plan when you go below that amount for how you're mm -hmm. gonna get back there. I think that that's a really good point. And if we don't have that threshold number, then we're just saying, okay, we're gonna try to get it back up, right? But uh, that's not a plan. And, and that's just kind of hoping, right? That we can at some point in the future have an idea of how to do that. So I think that, um, we having that structure in place is a great idea and so so um, i'd like to see some information about that or some work on that um and maybe some information from jennifer about her thoughts on that great any other comments from council is that yeah um so i guess 
a couple, a couple thoughts and I'm trying to write them down so I could stay on point. Um, there are a couple things, it may be in no particular order, but the comments about a um, uh, only $300,000 for affordable housing and at that um, on the chopping block already, if we have money, I, I just want to tip my hat to the, I mean, I've only been here for less than you know, two years with council that we've been able to get to that point. I know it's measly. I know everyone in council would love that to be quadrupled at the end of that. And, and and a lot of these programs, I think some of my frustration in sitting here was, let's do them all. And, and, and you guys have all done a lot of hard work to get to dollars in those buckets. And so my hat's off to you, and I don't think those are, are small potatoes. They may look like it when you Im immediately put it, um, put your eyes on it for the first time. Um, so I, I appreciate everyone else's work in getting to those points, and I will work to defend that and hopefully grow that. Um, so I just wanted to address that. Um, it, it also dovetails with, you know, a year of budget has been around forever, and, and we're, we're just moving one year at a time further down the road. And so we're here inheriting something that has been around for a long time, and, and um, I hope we can make some meaningful change. I hope we can address some, some community concerns, and I hope we can continue to evolve that discussion. Um, and, and I hope that everyone today who was in the council chambers, who was, had sent comments, who didn't send comments, but carries that passion in their heart, and it, you know is, is young in age now and ready to get involved for a long time, um, will continue to show up because it's gonna take that long-term commitment and those long-term dedicated people to, to continue the work that you guys have already done to get that 300,000 and hopefully someday it'll be a lot more. Um, so, I, so I encourage those who participated now to continue the discussion as some people indicated um, for the long-term and to do some real long hard work. Um, some specific things I'd like to see related to the budget. Um, the uh, state revenue sharing of 563,000, there seems to be maybe um, that list looks a lot different given everything we just heard and potentially we could relook at um, some of those dollars and immediately put those towards um, programs or getting programs rolling um, that would address things that we heard. Um, and and I'd like to have that discussion, maybe um, would, would have loved to hear more public testimony on that, but maybe um, there's a budget for, uh, I heard the term, we all went into a crash course on how to read and understand the budgets. And I'm sure um, that state assessment share revenue sharing got uh, to the bottom and, and, and maybe there was a little bit more of excitement that could have built around that, but perhaps we can reassess um, some of those dollars and immediately push those towards towards getting some programs going. Um, uh, whether it's part of this budget discussion, which it's not, but stemming from this budget discussion, I would like to establish a, a, or discuss how we, and what it looks like, but establish a citizen committee, whether it's an advisory committee or an oversight committee that really in charge, you know, develop and charge them with the mission of running with a lot of these programs and instituting and, and monthly or, or however long on a sustainable long-term um, discussion, manage and, and implement and discuss these. I think I've heard a lot of comments and I, I know they're well intentioned, but there's some specifics that you know miss the mark. We don't, we aren't in charge of the school district's budget. I wish we were. It happens in our city. We aren't in charge of their budget. Um, I, I would, I would and encourage. No, not in charge of. Right, and and a lot of those things that are are in our city aren't in our budget, aren't in our purview, aren't in our policy. I would love to have them happen. Um, and so th I think there's a a education a component that we could do to get our allies who are, who are fired up about it and encourage them to, to be proactive and point them in the right direction um, and, and then bring them in and, and help them look at our, our police department, our, our policing methods, our, our mental health approaches, all these things, see what we're already doing, see what other, other community partners are already doing and see if there are ways to bring those together. There may be an immediate, long, immediate um, things we could implement and, uh, and that are, have effective change and then there's gonna be really long-term um, ongoing monitoring that we need to do. So, I'd like to uh, work towards establishing that committee or oversight committee or, or group or, or whatever we're going to call it um, sooner rather than later. Additionally, I'd like to construct a plan to both deliberate and assess what our reserve percentage is and should be and publish a strategy to get to um, you know 18 percent or, or wherever we decide that. So two, two, two discussions. One is what should that published policy be, which is currently 25 percent, which kind of all, oh, oh you know. Um, up with what it is and then come up with a published plan prior to the adoption of this budget on how we're going to get to you know whatever we decide 15 17 18 percent 18 is my vote um and then i'd like um 
think there was some discussion that I thought, I think I'm also in that camp of may have lost that published memo, but I'd like, I'd like to second, or third or fifth Mark Davis's uh, list of questions and, and like kind of a published response to those. I, I see there's one document in here that's a published response to some questions that, that was helpful, but you know, I'd like to see more published responses, but essentially asking all of Mark Davis's questions to, uh, to staff. Um, I'd like to also encourage uh, the chief to reflect and return to our next meeting with some additional measures or, or some additional thoughts and ideas um, that his that his department can can start implementing or, or start thinking about in ways in which they could respond to citizens' comments without sort of knee-jerk reaction or um, immediate decisions that have skewed long-term effects. But um, bring together a list of those and then. Um, I guess in, in conjunction with the citizen committee, identify and engage in an assessment of larger jurisdictional partners already offering some services and how we could either work with them or help bring them in to the fold. And then I also wanted to ask the chief, if we did, um, does the police department have a requirement for officers to undergo routine impact and trauma and stress trainings independent of incidents is just sort of ongoing trainings and address those items so that's my list okay. go ahead chief if you're there okay sorry zach i didn't completely hear your question it was about training is, is that well correct? um i think mallory stiff miss stiff asked uh, <laughs> if the police has and as my notes but uh police has uh a policy in trauma and stress yeah. sort of um Perfect. training or counseling sessions i guess that is after a specific incident just in general oh great great question uh with respect to uh post instant debrief say we have a traumatic incident our staff have the ability to speak with somebody um through uh, uh not only the peer support program that we've started up this last year they've also got uh, uh the ability to uh, talk with somebody through the eap program employee assistance program but I think more importantly, uh, I think it was Mallory discussed or the thought of the need for uh, wellness checks, so to speak, making sure that our staff is okay mentally and that we're doing right by them. You'll notice in our in my budget that I that I submitted and requested, and we're there right now. We're sort of at the almost to the finish line. Uh, I, I did put some money aside, and I modeled it after the Oregon City Police Department. Thank you, Claudia, uh, who has. Uh, who have an annual wellness program, an annual wellness check, where they're gonna go and they're gonna be uh, seen by, this is voluntary though, uh, you, uh, we, we, it's not mandatory, uh, where the officers and all the staff for that matter, have the ability to go in, speak to a, uh, somebody that's a clinician in law enforcement, in that profession specifically, and, and see how they're doing, basically do a checkup, and then if they choose or they need to, um, it's apparent it would be incumbent upon them uh, to uh, go back and visit with them. And this person is a clinician that has a tremendous amount of respect within the profession um, that does things for Oregon City PD and candidly other law enforcement agencies in the uh, in the area. But I, I do want to touch on that. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I uh, Do you have a, and maybe not, um, shouldn't share it or, or what but uh, and i don't know if you have access to that if it's under some sort of um you know anonymity but do you have a sense of the percentage of, of officers that that take advantage of that program well that that program would start this fiscal year so it would be brand new okay i got it thank you we've got a question from kelly and then remy and then adam I, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to this and i'm thinking really the only thing that really hit me tonight that really needs addressing as far as this budget is concerned is possibly some of Mark's questions and the two that I thought were important I told you already. Everything else is kind of like squirrel. I mean, we don't need to be discussing this at this point in time. I mean, the budget is not going to change that much and obviously the police are proactively dealing with it. Uh, I think it would be lovely to have all of these programs, but to do everything that's no, to, to do everything that's been
again extraneously discussed uh, we don't have capacity for you have to get realistic about what we have capacity for and you know there are other people or other entities like the county and uh, the school district that you know they need to weigh in and do what their part is so I just I kind of want to bring up the fact that to to do a complete citizens committee and everything like that is just kind of like overkill in this particular situation. I'm sorry, I'm not unsympathetic. I do believe black lives matter. I don't feel that we have a serious problem in this town, not one that affects a major change in the budget as it currently planned. My two Thank you, Kelly, uh, Remy, and then Adam. Um, I was wondering if you could address, you said that um, the mental health check-ins right now, it's a voluntary uh, option for the police department. And, and can you talk to us a little bit about why that's voluntary instead of mandated? Thank you. Uh, candidly, uh, I, this would be something that um, we're going to need to get negotiations uh, or approval with the, um, the McMinnville Police Association, the union. Um, and uh, you know, I've not heard, and I've checked around throughout the state, any agency that's mandating, there's nothing legally that's uh, requiring it. Uh, we are doing it out of a, um, an abundance of uh, caution and to invest in our employees. That was the, that was the thought behind that. And to ensure that uh, those that uh, have or need the ability and desire the ability, not everybody is going to want to talk to somebody. That's just that's just the truth, uh, but providing them with that option is, uh, I think, incredibly valuable. Not only from an employee standpoint, but also a community standpoint. If, uh, if we're uh, able to help those that need a little bit of assistance, so. And will you educate us a little bit more on the process? If an officer wants to engage in a mental health check-in. What's the process that officer um, uh, undergoes? Do they have to contact somebody else within the PD or the union, or how do the, how do they initiate that process? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Remy. And they would initiate it themselves. Uh, we provide them with a list of provider. Uh, again, somebody that's a clinician within the profession that deals with these uh, with officers all the time. Uh, and it would be simply them going to talk to this person. Uh, in an annual basis and then uh, coming back uh, there's no disclosure to us whatsoever the only disclosure there would be if there's uh, any potential uh, uh, issues where uh, there's some sort of a, a you know a, a crime has been committed or something like that that's what's going to trigger that counselor uh, the therapist to provide information back to the PD one more follow-up on that so you said an annual check-in so in your budget request um that's for a one-time check-in or for as much uh mental health as might be required outside of what um outside of what's provided through the health insurance yeah that's a one-time city uh, uh benefit that uh I proposed and that you'll, you would see. And then the other follow-ups would be, uh, if, they're, if they choose to be, would be through their own insurance at the city. And can you talk to us a little bit about um, uh, mental health services and health insurance as it stands in the PD currently, please? Well, the insurance is covered or provided through the Teamsters organization. It's, I think, a Blue Cross uh, policy, but I don't know anything other than that. And I'm sorry, what was your other question? I was just wondering about regular access to um, to uh, health and mental health, which I see as being one and the same um, uh, through uh, the current in current insurance policies. I believe they've got uh, insurance that's similar to mine, so I, I believe that they've got the ability to to seek out mental health professionals or any sort of medical treatment, um, obviously with a deductible. But I, I couldn't tell you specifically what their deductibles are, but. I do know that that is, a, is one of their um, insurance coverages, a part of. Um, good, not to 
labor. Uh, I, I know Adam's not had a chance to, to weigh in and ask questions or give some thoughts. And so, Adam, I'll do that. And then in, in lieu of, the, we've got much more to go over. We've still got to meet as a urban renewal body this evening. So Adam, if you go. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I would second the other counselors that uh, would like some answers and feedback on Mark's questions. But specifically, before we get to our next budget cycle, um, I would definitely like to drill down a number that we as a council can agree to and, and strive for it and not just have it be this number from 2011 i think it should be current and it should be a number that we hold ourselves to and if we need to make those hard cuts then we make those hard cuts to to be at that number for our bond rate and for our constituents um as far as the all the testimony we took tonight and uh changing some things around the pd i'm definitely open to the conversation um throughout this next budget year, but I, I would definitely be opposed to any knee-jerk reactions to try and get something done in the next couple weeks. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm not sympathetic to, to what their message is. It's just I don't think that um, the amount of time and, and effort that's gone into this budget, I think it would create more uncertainty and more it'd make that department more unstable than uh, moving forward with, with what we know and uh, bringing professionals in from all those different sectors and what their costs would be and, and not just blindly stripping money out of a budget to to fund a, a different program when we don't even know what, what the cost is and what the effectiveness is of it at this point in time. And if it's even, you know, right-sized for our city. I mean, some, some programs should be ran by county or should be ran by state and we're still a city of 35,000 people, so we shouldn't be uh, trying to run programs of metro areas of over 100,000 people because we don't have the funds to do it. Yeah, without the community block grants and those types of things. Yeah, exactly, Mayor. Um, again, I think we've had a good discussion this evening, and like I say, I think what we do now is um, do some thoughts, and if you want to look into the budget, do so, but our next discussion will be as we get around our budget discussion at the, um, uh, at the council meeting coming up. So if I may, I'd like to move on with our, our agenda as outlined. Um, Number six on our agenda this evening is a consent agenda, um, considering a request from the Michael Book Estate uh, Incorporated. Uh, is there anyone that would like to have any items taken off of the consent agenda this evening? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. And it's been moved by Kelly and seconded by, was that Remy or Wendy? Wendy? Wendy, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Uh, tonight's uh, consent agenda passes unanimously six to zero. This takes us to uh, our first resolution this evening. It is resolution number 2020-33, a resolution authorizing the city manager to, end in, to enter into a contract with Cummins Incorporated for the purchase of an emergency standby generator for the water reclamation uh, facility and raw sewage pump station through Sourcewell uh, Interstate Cooperative Buying Program. And so Mike, we'll call on you to present. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. I'll refer you to the brief staff report that engineering services manager Larry Sherwood has placed in your packet, as well as the proposed resolution and several additional attachments related to this item. Uh, specifically, the city has been working with uh, McMinnville Water and Light for some time now related to power feeds to the water reclamation facility and the raw sewage pump station which is located at the old sewer treatment plant adjacent to the dog park. Both of those facilities are currently fed by two separate feeds by McMinnville Water and Light, but they have had concern that uh, 
in the event of a widespread regional power outage, we would not have uh, redundant power for either of those facilities. And so what you have in your packet this evening is a proposal to pr purchase two 1,000 kilowatt diesel generators, one for each facility that will provide emergency power in the uh, case of an outage. Um, certainly when both of these facilities were constructed in the 90s, the cost of emergency generators was uh, much higher and the technology has improved and the price has come down. So. Um, this purchase will be made through Sourcewell, which is an interstate cooperative purchasing program that the city has used in the past. We went through a review process and evaluated the three manufacturers that are in, involved in the Sourcewell purchasing program, Caterpillar, Kohler, and Cummins. Uh, at the end of the review, Cummins was rated the highest uh, manufacturer, and additionally, they were the least cost manufacturer. So the staff is proposing that uh, council approve the resolution uh, uh, purchasing two generators from Cummins in the amount of $460,902. At a later date, you will see a separate contract for the installation of these uh, generators at the facilities. And unless there are any questions, staff would recommend you adopt the resolution as presented. Thank you, Mike. Any questions of Mike? I I assume that cost is just for the generators. It doesn't include the installation. That's correct. The fiscal year uh, 21 budget includes $1.1 million for this uh, project. Uh, the additional cost above the generators will be the installation uh, and testing of the equipment. That'll be a separate contract at a later date. Mike. Um, Mike, the question that I might have, and I'm, I'm sure you guys have researched it uh, thoroughly, but I didn't see it in the report. Uh, from time to time, I, I, I know that there can be some grant money for generators uh, for, for backup purposes. Uh, have we looked into any of the federal statewide programs that might assist in the purchase of backup generators? Not as part of this particular project. Do you know, do, do you have a sense that there might be programs out there that could offset some of those costs? I, I know Backwater and Light, if I'm not mistaken, maybe participated in some type of, of uh, a, a grant program to pick up a, a, a generator because so much of that is uh, equated to emergency management and there can and sometimes are dollars available. I. I just throw that out. I don't know the answer, and I don't know if it's even pertinent. But if they're if it, they're available, sometimes it might be wise to take a look and see if that if there's some dollars out there. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Uh, certainly, uh, McMinnville Water and Lights team has been at the table as we've been working on this project. Um, you'll recall that the airport uh, procured an emergency generator okay. through the state's emergency management program where the state actually owns the generator and we get to use it, but they get to recall it at any time if they need it. That certainly wouldn't be a model that would work for a generator for generators of this size. Um, uh, these will be permanent installations um, at both facilities. Well, I knew you'd be more uh, on top of that. These are large generators. And so I just brought the question up because I, uh, I, I didn't know what the answer to that might be. Any other questions of Mike? Um, I would ask for a motion to approve resolution 20-33. So moved. And a second. Second. It's been moved by Sal, seconded by Wendy. All in favor of, uh, of resolution 2020-33, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any aye. Signify by saying nay. Um, resolution 2020-33 passes unanimously six to zero. That takes us uh, to consideration of resolution 2020-34, a resolution authorizing an inter fund uh, loan uh, uh, from the uh, wastewater capital fund to the general fund and to the air and the airport fund and so jennifer i'll call on you to present okay um yes thanks mayor so 
this, um, what you have before you is a resolution that would authorize internal borrowing to support the purchase of um, public safety equipment, specifically three police pursuit vehicles, um, as well as equipment for the McMinnville Fire Department, including eight defibrillators, as well as um, a breathing air compressor and another um, command vehicle for the fire department. The, um, the internal borrowing for the airport fund would be going to replace a, a fuel tank um, there. So the reason why pursuing internal borrowing makes sense for um, capital replacement costs is because um, it is a lower cost of financing for the departments making the purchase and then in terms of um, the funds that is lending the money, the wastewater capital fund, that allows them to use their excess cash and earn a slight premium over the interest rates that they are earning at the state local government investment pool. So it's a, it's a win-win for both sides. Um, the total amount of the entire borrowing is $775,000, and it is reflected in all of the um, all of these funds mentioned in their fiscal 2021 budget. Thank you, Jennifer. Any questions of Jennifer? Uh, can we delay this as well? Um, Sure. I mean, you don't you don't have to do it. Um, we can we can pull it. I'm not sure then if we. Why would we delay it? Remy, why would we delay it? Sorry, I'm getting there. I was flipping back and forth between screens. Um, uh, just because it's addressing. Uh, uh, just because we're talking about uh, having some further conversations about our budget that um, are, uh, you know, reflective of community conversation, and so to uh, to maybe have the uh, opportunity to have slightly more thorough conversations with the community um, is is why we would delay it, in my opinion. Or I, it's not, I, it's a question really, more than an opinion, it's, it's really a question. I see no reason personally to delay it. Any other comments? I would, I would be in favor of, of uh, delaying the decision. It, it is a funding mechanism for things that are already been talked about though. So what I, what I will what I will ask then is, do I have a motion to approve resolution 2020-34? I so move. And do I have a second? Second. So it's been uh, moved by Kelly and seconded by Adam. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. Nay. Okay, uh, this resolution 2020-34 uh, passes uh, in a vote of five in, uh, in, in a favor and one in opposition. Okay, uh, that takes us to our agenda uh, for the city council this evening. And so I'm going to go ahead and adjourn the city council meeting and we will roll right into the McMinnville Urban Renewal Agency meeting uh, of, uh, of uh, June 9th, 2020. Uh, and so I'll just, uh, again, for formality, uh, if you would take a roll call of those in attendance. Councillor Drabkin. Present. Councillor Garvin. Here. Councillor Geary? Here. Councillor Stassens? Here. Councillor Peralta? 
Here. Council President Minky. Here. And Mayor Hill. Here. And the purpose of uh, this meeting is to have our public uh, hearing on the proposed fiscal 2020-2021 budget for the uh, McMinnville Urban Renewal Agency. And so with that, I'm going to open up the public hearing and ask Jennifer to present. Um, yes, good evening. So um, this again is a, is a budget hearing to receive comment from the public on the urban renewal budget um, starting July 1 for next year. Um, the, the hearing is required by um, a local government uh, budget law and there was a publication of a summary of this budget um, published in the local paper on May 29th. Um, and we also, as in the case with as the city budget, we included um, the mechanism of people being able to provide public comment ahead of time through the website um, or through email. And we did not receive, um, at least through the website, any public comment regarding the um, urban renewal budget. So um, that is the extent of my um, my opening here. Any any questions before you open it up for the public? And Jennifer, from my perspective, uh, as I've re reviewed a tremendous number of of emails on budget items. There was nothing uh, related to the urban renewal district that I, because I read them all and forwarded those on to Jennifer and I, I didn't see any of them at the urban renewal district. So it looks like we have no written testimony. So I will open up the public hearing uh, then uh, on the McMinda urban renewal uh, fiscal year budget 2020, 2021. Is there anyone that would like to testify on that budget? Mayor, no one has signed up to testify on this budget. Thank you, Claudia. So I will go ahead and uh, close the public hearing on the urban renewal budget. Uh, item number three on our agenda this evening is a consent agenda, is the consent agenda and it's to consider the minutes from our December 10th, 2019 urban renewal agency meeting. Is there any counselor that would request to have this item taken off the consent agenda and heard later in the agenda? Seeing none, then I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. So moved. Second. It's been moved by uh, Wendy and seconded by Kelly. All in favor that uh, in all in favor of the consent agenda as presented, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed signify by saying nay. The uh, consent agenda passes unanimously six to zero this evening. That's uh, the only business that we had within our uh, McMinnville uh, uh, Urban Renewal Agency meeting this evening. So I will go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Council, for uh, your attentiveness this evening and your good questions. And any staff, again, thank you for all that you do. And anyone that's still on the line, thank you for your participation evening. Uh, this will close our uh, Zoom meeting this evening. Thank you all.